good morning in, in Manila. It's around like 48, 4.30, 4.30 a.m. In, in the Philippines, yeah? So uh, good morning to you. And uh, in my presentation uh, this morning, I reflect on the tales of uh, two futures, uh, not just as a theoretical construct, but uh, as an embodied experience emerging from the hundreds of uh, times I've facilitated and played this game, which I developed in 2019 and launched in uh, Bangkok, Thailand. So uh, the Dreams and Disruptions game is, is an imagination uh, foresight game. And I played this game around like 200 plus sessions uh, worldwide. And uh, I have uh, explored the uh, futures uh, through uh, the lenses, you know, uh, that I that emerged from playing that game, that uh, presented conversations and insights about the diversity of our culture, you know, the context of geographies and identities in in the way we envision the future. So uh, each iteration of uh, the game that I played has revealed. Uh, that the future is not a singular uh, trajectory to be predicted, but a plural evolving and uh, relational process of uh, becoming. This uh, realization has led me to delve deeper into the epistemology of, what, of, of foresight, uh, questioning how we understand, how we know and engage with the future. Uh, the game has become for me, just an exploration, more than an ex, uh, more than just an exploration of possibilities, it has become a space uh, for provocations, uh, as a way to challenge the hidden assumptions uh, and foundations of foresight practices, as has been introduced fifty years ago, uh, particularly as a as a way of knowing, as a thinking, as a methodology and tool in research, and as a knowledge base, you know, uh, for uh, for the sciences, uh, for social sciences, or for science, uh, among other ways of uh, not being and, and knowledge uh, in, in the last 30 years. And, uh, you know, uh, in fact, you know, questioning those assumptions as they are conventionally understood today. So uh, I just would like to present to you some assumptions uh, that a generation one futurist, uh, those be those you know uh, futurists that have, uh, in fact, you know, uh, defined what futures and foresight is today as a field of study, and as a, as a capability and a skill set, uh, primarily introduced by uh, our friends and colleagues and then mentors and, and teachers in, in in the U.S. in Europe is that uh, the future does not exist yet. Uh, this assumption uh, rests on the belief that the future is inherently open and uh, uncertain. And uh, this assumption underscores uh, the limitations of assuming a predetermined path, which is, of course, prediction. And future studies, uh, therefore, along those lines, uh, invites speculation, imagination, and uh, exploration of possibilities that have not yet manifested. However, indigenous or spiritual me methodologies often treat time cyclically or relationally, where past, present, and future are entangled. So for this uh, worldviews, uh, the ethno-linguistic community that I belong to assume that uh, the future might exist within a com continuity of experience and not necessarily invisible or absent or non-existent. Mm -hmm. So uh, the indigenous epistemology and the way they assume the future is that uh, the future carries a memory of the past. And that challenges the purely linear Western concept of for the future. Now, the second assumption that futurists has today when they study the future is that uh, apparently the way that I've seen it in the last 20 years of my practice is that future studies tend to emphasize technology and human progress as 
the primary drivers of change. And uh, when you have a technocentric view in the way you anticipate or make sense of the future is that uh, this particular paradigm focus on innovation, functionality, and expansion of uh, human capabilities. And uh, we often assume that there is a linear trajectory towards better future. However, this framing excludes non-Western indigenous and ecological perspectives, which might uh, prioritize not necessarily a technocentered or the technocentric uh, imagining of the future, but rather uh, it prioritizes relationality, sustainability, or non-human futures. So the technocentric and anthropocentric focus of uh, future studies often reinforces human exceptionalism, uh, ignoring the agency of the natural world or the importance of spiritual dimensions in futures thinking and future making. So the narrow focus on uh, technology, you know, could limit the range of uh, the future that we can in fact imagine. And uh, when we do that, it perpetuates the dominance of, uh, of a Western development narrative. And uh, another one is, uh, you know, uh, one particular assumption, again, is that uh, this reflects the tendency, of course, within future studies uh, on structured frameworks, methodologies, and tools. All right. Uh, the way we do futures and foresight today, particularly in education, is that it is, it is technique-driven, methodological-driven, tool-based, and conceptual, which is, of course, uh, primarily informed by uh, by science, which relies on data that tells us that reality is data and data is reality. And uh, of course, features and foresight building on the legacy of, of the two world wars and uh, the declassification, you know, of uh, our uh, military establishment institutions uh, in, in the way, of course, uh, by which you can, in fact, you know, uh, anticipate the blind, blind spots and win the war was uh, the emergence and the introduction of frameworks, methodologies, and tools. So futures and foresight uh, after the Second World War, you know, uh, embarked on that uh, approach, which was driven by methods, tools, and uh, uh, resources, right? Uh, of course, building on the legacy of science as well was uh, the invention of scenario planning, forecasting, horizon scanning to explore and anticipate futures. While these tools provide rigor and consistency, they can also limit creativity and intuition. So uh, the methodological focus that we have in future studies uh, today, I would critic as a futurist may marginalize experiential, the artistic or indigenous ways of knowing. So uh, futures thinking, if it, is, if it is too technique, methodological or tool-based driven, or let's just say becoming overly academic or technocratic if, uh, if it emphasizes the tools too much at the expense of engaging diverse communities and ways of knowing uh, could uh, become eventually, you know, a constraint, you know, uh, that disables, uh, you know, a particular community to foster imaginative storytelling. And uh, of course, uh, as you can see in many of the assumptions, I'm not going to discuss all of them uh, uh, this morning, is that, that uh, of course, overall, you know, futures and foresight today underscores the role of human agency in shaping futures. And it frames uh, the future as, 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 a cam as a canvas for intentional action and collective vision, placing responsibility on societies to actively engage in future making rather than uh, possibly waiting for change. While empowerment is the focus, right? The way I see futures and foresight today is that there's too much focus on the thin thing, thingification of uh, perception, right? Of the imagination, because we all want to create and envision a space for a man, man, making mental assertions about it, which is of course the reason why we mentally assert something about the future is because that we so that we can use this for planning contingency innovation strategy among other things you know uh, that uh, 
are functional for us when it comes to you know, organization, management, uh, among others. So uh, in this context, when we try to you know, uh, overemphasize our ability, human ability to create things, right? it assumes that humans have the capacity and the right to create futures, or in other words, you know, conquer it. And uh, sidelining non-human agents, natural systems, or un unintended consequences. And uh, more often than not, those are the type of blind spots that we get to have when we uh, try to, you know, uh, create things out of, uh, of course, you know, embarking from the Western assumption of the future, the invisible. So uh, envisioning futures uh, in this context often reflects a lot of biases, you know, uh, privileging perspectives of those positions in power, right? Because if you try to look into the, the ability of institutions and organizations to create, in fact, is, is driven and primarily influenced by uh, power. And this raises ethical questions about whose visions are prioritized in the process of future making. You know, and uh, last but not the least, of course, the future, apparently, uh, at, at least in the context of future studies, is that uh, almost all, uh, more often than not, you know, we see the future as a case study, a plan, a strategy, a goal, an innovation, or a target. So uh, this uh, assumption aligns with the pragmatic application of futures thinking, especially in corporate policy institutional settings, which, of course, I'm not saying that's strong. But then when we treat the future as an object of, for analysis, innovation, strategic planning, uh, of course, we've seen this for many, many years, including strategic planning, is that it allows organization to design specific interventions and outcomes. While these things are practical, this approach, however, risks commodifying the future, treating it as a resource to be managed and optimized. And uh, that significantly reduced, you know, uh, <laughs> Uh, the future, it, and it strips away the richness and uncertainty of the future. You know, if it's too technical, we base it on exercise and performance metrics. You know, of course, we all know this. Uh, we've seen this. We've heard this, that uh, it is uh, primarily, you know, uh, the daughter of neoliberalism, where in uh, futures are driven by goals and targets, reinforcing productivity and profit paradigms at the expense of the communities at the expense of nature, at the expense of care, at the expense of alternative value systems. This assumption would later inform UNESCO's definition of futures literacy. You know, uh, futures literacy by UNESCO, I'm a part of this group anyway, like uh, that actually like uh, conceptualized this uh, in 2012. But then later on, of course, we learned in the process, especially when I started, uh, you know, uh, studying, you know, decoloniality, and uh, you know uh, uh, the epistemology and the metaphysics of uh, my in my own indigenous community that I started to question and wonder why we assume and define the future as such. Uh, again, in the context of its function, you know, uh, the UNESCO, uh, inspired by the idea of literacy as well, is that it defined uh, f the uh, future's literacy as the capability to use the future as an asset, resource, and tool to uh, innovate and change uh, today. So uh, the future, uh, at least in this context, is seen as a, as a usable asset and resource for innovation, change, and transformation today. Of course, it's not without limitations and uh, potential pitfalls. Now, one of the things that uh, I learned uh, later on is that treating the future as an asset or resource can lead to its commodification, where, uh, you know, uh, eventually we're going to, view it as something to be exploited for profit or power. And uh, it leads to in the instrument, uh, it leads to the risk of uh, instrumentalizing it, you know, turning the future into a tool for specific interest, often reinforcing existing hierarchies and inequalities. So framing the future as a, as a resource could unconsciously perpetuate the idea that it is a thing to be used and controlled rather than a shared space uh, of uh, possibility. And uh, apparently, uh, you know, uh, the use of the word use, the future, you know, mirrors some sort of a colonial mindset where uh, 
you know, many, many years ago, uh, 500, 300, 400 years ago, from the 14th, you know, uh, of course, until, you know, uh, nations uh, that were colonized declared their independence, then you also have the continuity of, uh, you know, the post-colonial world was that uh, apparently, you know, you can see this in many texts that land, water, people, and knowledge uh, that were, uh, so, you know, assumed to be discovered were treated as assets to be used, extracted, and exploited. And uh, if that becomes the case, uh, you know, the future defined as something that we can, in fact, like exploit and extract for utilization uh, purposes, you know, often privileges, you know, cert certain narratives like, you know, the technocratic narrative, the corporate narrative, the elite narrative, the dynastic narrative, you know, and it leaves the marginalized communities without a voice in shaping their own futures. So when the future is treated as an asset or resource, uh, there's a risk of reducing the future to utilitarian concerns, again, such as efficiency, profit, and risk management. So viewing the futures as a resource often uh, imposes a specific visions of progress, usually rooted in westernizations ide uh, or ideas of growth innovation and development. And this can perpetuate a temporal colonialism where alternative futures like, you know, brought upon by indigenous or regenerative ways of thinking are marginalized or dismissed. So uh, while using the future as an asset and resource can indeed, I acknowledge this, you know, uh, unlock opportunities for innovation, resilience and strategic thinking, uh, it, all, it also carries significant risk. So uh, what I'm trying to say here is that the future is not a commodity to be owned or exploited. It is a commons that must be nurtured with care, humility, respect, and inclusivity. So uh, I would say probably, you know, uh, no, not probably, definitely, this is something that I'll, you know, I'll bring out to UNESCO as well, that, you know, we might want to like some sort of, you know, have a conversation about this and probably, you know, question this definition uh, when we refer to futures literacy and probably, uh, you know, explore ways by which we can be more, uh, you know, sensitive, you know, and uh, not focus too much on the use of the future as an asset resource and tool, right? Uh, you know, and in fact, you know, uh, 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 you know, pr primarily, if you also like put futures literacy in, in this context, you know, uh, the premise, in fact, is really about, you know, what? Continued economic growth. And uh, this one is a, 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 you know, one of the more popular, widely used conceptual tool in future studies. It was, you know, developed by Joseph Voros, and it's called it is called the, the Joros, Joseph Voros Futures Cone. So, uh, as you can see here, uh, this visually organizes potential futures according to various degrees of likelihood and desirability, emphasizing that the future is not a single outcome but a field of possibilities. While the futures cone offers a useful framework, it carries certain conceptual li limitations, especially the assumption that all futures unfold from the present moment, right? Uh, as you can see in, 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 in the framework, that it assumes that the future unfolds from the present. Well, of course, you know, he's correct. But then the cone structure suggests that futures radiate outwardly only from the present, as if the present is the sole origin of all possible futures. You know, a dislinear framing of time aligns with Western modernist perspective of progress and development. However, many indigenous cultures and non-Western epistemologies see time as cyclical or recursive, where futures are not just downstream from the present, but also influenced by ancestral wills, wisdom, and past pot patterns. The model does not account for the possibility that some futures may already exist in the past or are timeless, always present in cultural memory or myth. So the cone, despite its potential plausible future categories, still assumes that the future can be predicted or categorized based on what we know today. This approach risks leaving out emergent futures those that arise from unexpected discontinuous change. You know, many transformative changes in history were unforeseeable based on existing trends or knowledge. The cone offers no clear space for radical novelty, futures that are entirely outside of current imaginaries or driven by complex emerging systems. 
The cone could benefit from a chaotic or emergent futures layer that acknowledges a central feature of future making. Of course, in reality, there's what we call randomness. And uh, you know, randomness primarily is not necessarily something that you can, in fact, map as a data in the present. And of course, you know, you cannot actually, in fact, organize the future into neat categories. So the cone risk reducing futures to objects of analysis, things that can be projected, measured, or controlled. Of course, I know this. Uh, I, I know Joseph Borus is a theoretical physicist. But then again, you know, this reductionist tendency allies with a technocrat technocratic worldview, uh, where futures are seen as problems to be solved through better forecasting and planning. It limits the space for futures to be felt, experienced, or imagined relationally, treating them instead as strategic targets or goals. What I'm trying to say here is that futures should also be seen as a living relational processes, not just concepts to be classified or mastered. Now, this is the assumptions that I have like written down of the years of my futures and foresight practice, leveraging on uh, the learnings that I get from reading uh, the coloniality, the globe, global South myths and metaphors, and my own ethno-linguistic uh, uh, language and uh, the stories of my ancestors. And this is what I learned. You know, it run, it opposes to the previous worldviews or assumptions that I just, you know, shared with you. One is that the future cannot be a blank slate. All futures are shaped by the echoes and lessons of the past. The future exists within a continuity of experience. It is a memory of the past and, and the present. The future like the present cannot be without the past. It suggests, you know, this view suggests that human experience flows like a river, right? Where past moments provide the foundation for both present actions and future possibilities. It also implies that every choice made carries the imprint of memory heritage and historical events which cannot be erased or bypassed. Second, you know, this statement echoes indigenous perspectives on time, where time is not divided into its discrete parts, but instead exists as an entangled web. The past, present, and future are entangled. They exist sim simultaneously in, in a person, and they are interconnected. So the choices that we make now affect not only our immediate realities, but also how we interpret our past and imagine our futures. So what I'm trying to say here is that I am inviting everyone to think of time as a multi-layered continuum where moments resonate across different points influencing one another. Unlike the linear notion of time, this perspective suggests that time moves in cycles, like seasons or life cycles. So the future is recursive. It implies that events or patterns reappear in altered forms, inviting learning, reflection, and renewal. You know, and this view is common in indigenous communities where the rhythm of life, ceremonies, and natural events serve as a reminder that future emerges from relational cycles, from the relationship that we have with nature, from the relationship that we have with non-human entities like animals and rivers and plants and stones and fire and our kin, our parents, our grandfathers, you know, and our ancestors. So the future is nested and influenced by ancestor, language, culture, and heritage. The future is, I would say, definitely nested in nature the natural and the cosmic world. They are not mere data. And uh, the future is not merely technological or data-driven. While I agree that it must be or should be data-driven, mu we must transcend our understanding that it is merely technological or data-driven. But rather, it is deeply rooted in intangible legacies as well. You know why? Because this acknowledges the future that are shaped by stories passed down through generations. And by doing that, we honor these legacies. In this sense, 
you know, features are no longer abstract projections, but extensions of who we are connected to the spirits and knowledge of our sex ancestor. That why, that's why in, uh, indigenous people, right? Like I did a literature review on this, uh, 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 my, uh, a paper on what I'm, I'm currently speaking about now will come out in the Journal of Future Studies next month. You know, that the future is kin. You know, uh, that is, it is not just about you know, projecting technology and its implication and outcome, you know, to make things better in the context of continued growth. But then I would ask as well that what kind of relationship would you want to have with the future? You know, so, and some other assumption as well that places features within the larger uh, ecological and cosmic order, reminding us, you know, the future that human actions are uh, inseparable from the rhythms of nature and the universe. The future is not human-centered, it's not a human-centered project, but a shared space within ecosystem where both the natural world and uh, cosmic movements inform what is possible and sustainable. So, uh, you know, the idea that the future is akin uh, personalizes the future as something relational, like a family member or a friend. You know, it suggests that we are living in a relationship with the future, one that requires care, respect, and co-creation. You know, and what if you're gonna like tr uh, translate this in, into you know, some sort of a question? My question would be: What responsibilities do we have toward future generations, the generations that does not exist yet, right? But then something that we can in fact perceive and imagine. You know, how do we treat the future with kindness? as if it were an extension of our own community, of our own person, of our own family. So, uh, you know, th this statement implies that overall the future are, are embedded, you know, in the past, present, in the future. You know, that the future is an unrealized possibility. It could also be an unrealized dream, right? It, is, it could also mean an unrealized way of being that were set aside uh, and uh, with this, you know, uh, it invites us, the future, to revisit our histories, our myths, and our overlooked knowledge to unlock new paths forward. So this view encourages curiosity about what was left behind and suggests that potential futures may lie dormant, waiting for the right moment or recognition to emerge. And the future is fluid. You know, rather than it being rigid or predetermined, the future is alive and real with many possibilities constantly shifting. And uh, of course, uh, it, it not only asks us to embrace imagination, experimentation, and openness, it also reminds us that the future is not something that we should control, but something that we should explore and co-create. So, Overall, at least uh, in this context or assumption, is that it also values recognition, you know, uh, recognizes the value of artistic expression, play, in and imagination and exploring possible future. You know, uh, the future isn't just data, at least in the context of the West, but from the non West, the future is a metaphor, it is an embodied experience, in that there are no future absolutes. Right? The way we imagine the future today is can only be temporarily true. You know, they are not infinite. Right? And that suggests, you know, some sort of a value that we need to recognize, uh, humility, right, uh, about uh, the future. And in fact, you know, this framework, you know, uh, I would say reflects the things that I just share with you in the last slide. You know, uh, the diagram provides a metaphorical and systematic view of time, emphasizing the relationship between multiple past, multiple present, and multiple futures. It visually challenges Joseph Borus' cone of the future, or notion of time, and it reveals instead that the future, present, and past are interconnected and recursive. The past is not singular, but composed of multiple fragmented narratives. There are different forms of past. There are different forms of histories and myths, as well as erased and forgotten knowledge. And this 
roots serves as the foundation for the futures we imagine, showing that our understanding of the past deeply informs how we experience the present and envision the future. And it's not just the past. The present also is not a singular point as what Joseph Vorus tried to present to us, but a branching process where different present and realities coexist. Each present or different present represents a convergence of different choices, actions, geographies, and interpretation leading to diverging paths forward. Now, this framework also suggests, you know, that the future time is circular, you know, that it does not move in a straight line, but in cycles where patterns repeat and reappear in different forms. You know, this reflects indigenous cosmologies where time is recursive and experiences look back to inform new cycles. And this framework also presents that they are erased knowledge and uncertain past. In the present, we are constantly grappling with what has been lost and what, has rem what remains uncertain. This is particularly true in the colonized communities and geographies. And uh, when there are erased knowledge and uncertain past, this affects you know, a community or people's ability to act in the present and imagine the future that they try to create and attempt. But then in order for you to gain clarity about the future that we prefer, because preferable future are value judgment driven type of futures. And uh, in order for you to, in fact, you know, not what, you know, identify what is preferable is that uh, it is very important that we need to reclaim or reclaim those who erase knowledge or forget in past by deconstructing your language, you know, by deconstructing your food, deconstructing your culture, you know, deconstructing your way of life or whatever practices that, you know, helps you define you know, who you are and influences the way you perceive and imagine the future, right? And uh, in fact, in this framework, it presents the present as a crossroad, right? The present, of course, we all know this, like uh, I, I would say that uh, this particularly reflects, some, uh, you know, an indigenous uh, way of perceiving the future as something that, you know, uh, emerges, you know, in multiple pathways or in heterogeneous pathways is that the present is a space of both continuity and discontinuity. There are different strands of, of, of the past, different strands of the future that surface the present, creating new openings for paths and possibilities. And of course, you know, it acknowledges that the present is not neutral. It is a space of choice and tension where different realities compete and converge, shaping what features become possible. So uh, the visualization as a whole emphasizes the entanglement of the past, present, and future, and the entanglement of time. It shows that the past, present, and future are multiple, they are fluid, cyclical, and recursive. The future does not emerge from nothing. It emerges from something. It is deeply rooted in the stories, experiences, and knowledge systems of the past that is carried through the present and imagine evolving into different future. So it suggests that the past events are not over, that the present is not just a fleeting moment, and that the future is not an end point. You know, uh, in, in this context is that, you know, the future flows in a relational web of the past, present, and the future. And uh, in fact, you know, you can even re retroactively reshape our understanding of the future by revisiting and uncovering our erased histories. That is particularly true for anthropology uh, in part, uh, as well. So uh, now I would like to present, you know, uh, the two tales of uh, the two tales of the future here. One is uh, the tale of conquest, and the second is the tale of reverence. So, when viewed through the lens of conquest, the future is framed as a territory to be conquered, colonized, and controlled. The future, as if, is only a temporal marker 
like 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 50, 100, 500 years for planning purposes, right? Or for discovery. But then, in fact, you know, uh, we can, I, I'm, I'm saying, I'm trying to argue that, you know, you can, in fact, like transcend that. But then I'm just trying to say that, you know, if we limit ourselves in defining the future as a temporal marker or space that must be mastered through foresight, planning, and technology, you know, uh, it would definitely reflect many of the assumptions that I just presented a moment ago, that the future is the linear progression from the present, that the futures or future studies emphasis only emphasizes uh, probability and the just capability, that the future is just about the, the domain of the technocratic, that the future must only be human-centered, that its narrative must prioritize human agency and dominance. So the tale of conquest, you know, uh, frames a profoundly modernist aligning with Western ideas of progress and growth, right? Uh, which is informed and driven by, of course, the Renaissance era, just as the colonial powers sought to expand their influence over new, unknown, and dangerous territories that the future must be feared, right? And that the unknown must be feared and therefore must be conquered, you know, uh, that colonizers and modern societies sought to expand to. So futures thinking or the future when focus on techniques, tools, and methods can resemble a military strategy where the objective is to anticipate risk, eliminate uncertainties, and seize opportunities. This reflects a desire to conquer the unknown and reduce the future to manageable, predictable outcomes. Having conquered or control or having control over the future ensures that it aligns with the vision of the artificial, the technological, the political and the economic. You know, and there are many, you know, dangers and limits to that. If we try to attempt to create a future that is driven by a tale of conquest. Now, the future as a tale of reverence elicits and harnesses the view that the future is alive, unpredictable, and deeply personal. It asks us not just to plan for it, but to feel it, relate to it, and dream with it, to engage in futures work as a practice of love, stewardship, and play. This perspective urges us to develop futures not only as a strategic goals, but as something that must be shared, something that need to be creative, and something that enables our experiences to evolve by acknowledging and honoring the past, embracing the magic of the moment, and welcoming the unknown, not as a danger, right? The future is not something that is external or predetermined. Humans has an evolving relationship with the future, and we must learn to engage with it by through relational processes. Just as we nurture relationship with our loved ones, the future asks for care, reciprocity, and respect. Imagine in a story of a persona, let's say, that uh, my daughter, for example, my seven-year-old daughter, if, he, if she gets to learn and acknowledge that the future is kin, it could suggest a way of knowing that the future is intimate, that we can, in fact, build a familiar relationship with time, one that invites care, trust, and accountability to future generations. And the tale of reverence assumes that time is not linear, but cyclical, and moments from the past, present, and future influences one another. Actions today carry echoes of history and shape future possibilities. Our unexplored dreams, forgotten knowledge, and ancestral wisdom, I would say, remain dormant in the past, waiting for the right moment to emerge. So human futures are deeply intertwined with the rhythms of nature and the cosmos. They help 
you know, our personal health, our ecological health, the health of our cities, the health of our communities and our nation, you know, are, are dependent on the, on, on, on the ecosystem by which it exists. And the way we imagine the future, whether we consider the future as something that we fear or something that, you know, uh, something or, or something that we're, we're, we're hope emerge reflects our mental health, right? The, the kind of mentality that we have about the future. And, the, and if we think about sustainability, I think the tale of reverence, you know, can in fact uh, enables, uh, enable us to nurture and, and flourish, you know, uh, hope that uh, engenders respect uh, and interdependence. In, in, in a tale of reverence, you know, mistakes, experiments, and even failures hold seeds of transformation because the future is a process of learning and becoming, not a flawless path to be mastered, to be perfected. You know, uh, I would like to end this by saying that time flows like a dance. It is reciprocal, rhythmic, and collaborative. Futures are not reached through con control or force, but through participation and awareness. <clears throat> Futures making is an act of reverence. You know, uh, the future is sacred, like your water, like your rivers, right? Uh, if we consider them as living entities, our life is, is, sac is sacred. And if we deem the future as sacred, it enables us to practice, you know, uh, this habit of weaving memory presence and vision together. You know, it calls for imagination, empathy, and openness to the unknown. The tale of reverence offers a profound shift in how we view and engage with the future. Rather than treating the future as a distant point to achieve to, or to arrive on, why can't we become the future itself? By building better relationships with our past, with nature, with creativity and with others. So the key insight, right, that I learned about this tale of reverence is that the future is not a predetermined destination. It is a living process of becoming, shaping how we relate to the world around us and how we carry forward the wisdom of those who came before. The ultimate invitation, as far as this tale is concerned, is to dance with the future. To explore it as a playful, evolving experience rooted in reverence, respect, reciprocity, and care. The present, like the future, cannot be without the past. This is what it means to decolonize the future. To shift radically from the view of utility, we must emphasize the profound significance of relationality and foresight. Thank you very much. Mm, thank you, Sherman, so much to, to chew on there. Uh, yeah, love seeing the, the gratitude and the, the squares. Um, there are a few questions. Um, Nicole, do you want to speak to yours? Oh, you're on mute still. Oh, had to hit the button twice. Um, I was typing it up as I was formulating it to try to be somewhat succinct, but um, I really appreciated that resonates with a lot of the relationship I take with the future and gives me some new tools that um, I feel like I can use to make it clearer outside of my own head and heart and spirit um, and really does address some of the discomfort and challenges I've had with other forecasting foresight type of tools. Um, so thank you for adding to my toolbox here. I have worked um, in all kinds of higher education institutions in the U.S., tiny private colleges that are really experiential and experimental to like large public research and land-grant universities and a couple things in between, big elite private universities. And so I feel like I have a pretty um, varied view on a lot of the conversations and possibilities in those spaces. And my diagnosis at this point, sort of 15 years in, is that um, 
formal education, especially higher education in the U.S., is so invested in the futurity of modernity coloniality. Um, and, of course, U.S. American imperial he hegemony. Um, you know, had strategic positions like designing the strategic plans and the initiatives, places where I ought to be able to really like influence this toward relationality, reciprocity, other ways of knowing and being, disinvestment, uncertainty. And it hasn't worked. Like as much as tr trying to get into those positions and and center these things, it I am finding that there's just really shallow skills and not a lot of receptivity to moving into the relational paradigm. And so I'm wondering if you have recommendations for educators who are working within or very closely adjacent to mainstream institutions of education on how to use these conceptions of the future, the concepts of um, reverence and relationality to try to both reorient the strategic priorities of those organizations, um, but also to make the culture and paradigm shifts that are needed at multiple levels. Um, Cause I am really like convinced of the necessity of this as a way of being faithful to the students who are still coming into those institutions at this point um, and, and doing right by them. And yet at the same time, I'm really hesitant to move through what we just finished moving through in the sort of diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice space of like, okay, here are all the initiatives and we're just going to commodify them again and actually not let them change our heart or our soul in any way. So that's kind of a long question, but the application in these contexts that are like really the debt laden, intensive educational experiences that set people up for then the work they do in the world feels really important to me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, my, my, my experience is that, you know, uh, for example, you know, I'm also a consultant in a facilitate foresight features workshop with different organization. But then what I did, uh, as far as my approach is concerned, is that I don't get straight right away into reports, right? Like, okay, by banks, uh, by institution, by experts, some other thing that this is the future or some multiple or probable features, right? So uh, I begin by facilitating a, an activity by you know asking them to question the future, right? Like if you're gonna ask three questions about the future of artificial intelligence in the year 2040, what would the most compelling questions be for you that you can ask as far as the future of AI, for example, I uh, just three think of, of, of three most compelling questions that you can think about. So if you have like around five people in a group or 30 people in a room, right? Like you'll be able to generate like around 30 to 60 compelling questions, right? And then let them have a conversation about those questions. And then when people get to have an opportunity to have a conversation about the questions that they think are most compelling, you know, leads them to unpack it and reveal, you know, the essence of the questions that in the first place that they are asking. So it becomes a meaning, you know, a uh, meaning making conversation. You know, and then when meaning making conversation emerge at the outset and they begin to question, you know, the, the future, it, it sets them open their mind to in fact question the data that that they'll kind of like have a conversation about in the process, right? So it's not really about, you know, uh, knowing what the answers are, but then, you know, the, because the questions are so comp compelling and important, important to them, it, it, it touches who they are as people, as person, as a member of the organization, you know, why, why? and then, you know, one of the workshop that I had, that I had was that, you know, why was I doing this, you know? <laughs> Yeah, and then when people begin to ask those types of questions, uh, yeah, it's, it's really about, you know, uh, they start to wonder, right? And when people begin to wonder, it opens up, it opens them to acknowledge the importance of not knowing something, right? And uh, when they acknowledge the importance of, uh, let's just say, ignorance, for example, right? <laughs> 
being ignorant about the things that you previously perhaps knew about or ex or an expert on, you know, uh, opens their mind, right? And when they open their mind, they're they're gonna like search for some is there something else, right? Yeah, and then when they ask those things, when they invite you to help them, like uh, you know, to not necessarily help them or have a conversation with them, you know, that becomes some sort of an entry point, you know, uh, for you to uh, introduce this stuff, right? Not by evangelizing it, but saying that you know there are different ways of knowing, right? You know, and especially in organization, they are not really into epistemologies, right? They're not. But then they love stories, right? Like they love metaphors as well. You know, at some point in their lives, they were into literature and art, right? Like, <laughs> but and then if 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 they open themselves into that that conversation, that then becomes an entry point wherein you know you can have a conversation about these things, right? And uh, when they reflect on that, you know, they the reframing and rethinking begins. And they have a different way of knowing about the things that they've been doing, whether it's a strategy or innovation and planning. That's not just, it's no longer about just that, but rather, you know, uh, acknowledging and, and suddenly remembering or perhaps realizing that, you know, I'm going to have to spend my life on this for the next 50, 20 years, right? Like, you know, it must be meaningful. And at least one uh, a client that I had, you know, uh, Sherman, it must be joyful, right? Like, it's not just about, you know, uh, <laughs> the things that we, you know, uh, experience on a Monday morning that, you know, like stress and we, or we go again and those kinds of stuff. And, uh, you know, if you're in organization, you know, suddenly they realize that this is an energy game, right? I'm going to spend my life into it. You know, I'm going to spend my energy every day. Right. If I'm going to spay in my energy into something, it must as well be meaningful, right? Like, it has to be experiential, right? And then, uh, you know, the tools and methods are just tools, right? Uh, to order knowledge, you know. Uh, then suddenly I realize this is not really about the tools and methods, really, right? It's 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 just that it helps you to you know facilitate and put organized knowledge, and you know uh, prompt. You know, uh, uh, you know, thinking in a way that is not necessarily chaotic, uh, but at least systematic, right, and, and logical, you know, to, uh, to some extent. But then they would realize uh, later on uh, that uh, it's really about the conversation that we're having and the relationship that emerges from the conversation that we're having, right? So when people are having a conversation and, uh, you know, building shared narratives together of what they're, you know, uh, what they prefer, what, what's important to them is that it begins to create some sort of relationship in the process, right? And when they realize that relationships are important, that even if you have artificial intelligence, that if you do not have a good relationship with your you know, office mate or your boss, you know, it, it won't work, <laughs> it won't work.